Mr. James, or you go by Gimp on uh, social media. How you doing, man? Gimp, Gimp, yes, very well. How Gimp. are you, Thomas? Good, very, very good. Um, so tell, tell, tell me a little bit about yourself. I know who you are, but the people listening probably don't. They should because you <laughs> are, you and your team are responsible for, I would argue, Devolver's most successful game. Um, oh wow! Uh, thank I you think, very much. I think you would agree, right? I don't know, actually. Um, I guess they did Fall Guys originally, but um, yeah. yeah, it's done It's done well. Um, so my name's James, James Pearmain. Uh, I am the art director at Massive Monster. Um, we recently put out Cult of the Lamb. Or actually, it's been out for a year and a half now, but it feels like it was recently. Um, and yeah, I'm here in, in England, Bristol, England. Awesome. So when you say art director, you are doing the 2D sprites for... Cult of the Lamb. Yes, uh, well, we, we have a couple of other artists now. Um, so sort of the, the art team at the moment is made up of um, myself, and then we have Carlos Dal Dalmau, who's kind of doing a lot of the art as well. Um, mm -hmm. And then Julian Wilton, who's our creative director, also does, does some art as well. Um, so my kind of, my role has changed a little bit over, over the last couple of years. Um, but yeah, definitely kind of did a lot of the artwork in the game and, and the majority of all the animation as well. Right. Um, yeah. Are you are you responsible for are you responsible for that look? Right. That cult of the lamb look. It's that that edgy, cute look. Um, are you the guy who guides? Are you the guiding hand for that that art? I'd, um, I um I don't think I can take full credit for it because I think um, Julian, our creative director, uh, definitely did a lot of early pre-production work um but we kind of right. brainstormed a lot of ideas early gotcha. on um so he kind of quickly moved to a more of a zoomed out role and kind of helping with more tech art stuff um but yeah like definitely kind of we we kind of worked together to develop that and i think we kind of both have quite a similar art style so so uh, kind of developed it together um but yeah so I, I definitely can't take credit for that but as the project moved on I, I kind of took the art director role and kind of did the majority of the artwork and kind of started working with other artists as well later on to kind of direct them and help them kind of um make stuff that would fit into the world sort of thing sweet sweet so let's let's start here we're gonna we're gonna talk about two primary things in this podcast the first one is uh i i, I want to talk about the it's really about what makes effective artwork for a, a video game. Um, what makes it effective from a marketing perspective? And I think Cult of the Lamb is a, it's a case study in the marketability or how to make 2D art marketable. And so I wanna talk about that, but I also wanna talk about the technical side, which is from point A to point Z, how the, how the game is created in the, from the art perspective. Right. Before we talk about those two things, though, I wanted to ask you how you got into this to begin with. Um, a lot of my listeners are hobbyists right now, and they they probably felt the same way you felt like when you were I guess you started when you were a teenager. Maybe you can tell me more about it. But I know when I started making games, I felt like it was a silly hobby that it was never going to turn into anything. It was never going to turn into a day job. Um, so let's start with that before we even move into the art side of things. How did you get into this? What was your journey? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I I started um, as as you said, I guess, just sort of uh, as a hobby, making silly animations with Flash um, and posting them up on on Newgrounds, um, and that was a lot of fun. And it was mainly just sort of as a way to express myself and make stupid jokes with my friends. Um, <laughs> that kind of kind of quickly realized that I could actually make games with Flash as well. Um, and Newgrounds was a really good uh, sort of creative hub uh, for that kind of thing. And you could find other people to work with. Um, and I, I've never really been uh, a programmer or had that. My mind doesn't really work that way. But um, I kind of found some people to collaborate with and make some games with. Um, just sort of uh, for fun, really. Um, and then we then I did one game that um, I, I found a, a programmer who was a lot more experienced than I was. Uh, and we made a game and it did really well and made some good money. Uh, and I was kind of like, oh, I can actually, you know, How make money doing this. That was, I must have been, so the game was called Penguins with a Z. Uh, and I must have been, I think, 18, 19. Yeah. Um, 
and it kind of we we did i don't know if you remember because i know you come from a similar background of the flash game yeah, things, very but, um, similar that's my yeah. first big paycheck was when i was 18 19 yeah yeah so sim- similar and i was of... like i made sure all my friends knew you know i remember <laughs> <laughs> i remember telling all my friends holy crap i just made 20 grand off yeah. of this stupid 15 minute flash game on Newgrounds. Uh, so very similar situation as you yeah yeah so that exact thing and and sort of had a big chunk of money like that and uh you know, I remember taking all my friends to Amsterdam and paying for everything, um, getting a penthouse <laughs> and blowing it all in, yeah, in, you know. I know, right? And then suddenly it's all gone. <laughs> yeah, uh, I was in, oh, so. I've, I've spent it all, so I'm going to have to do this again. Um, yep, exactly. But yeah, and, it, and I, I guess you, I think you started out in a similar time where it was quite mm-hmm. a lucrative thing. Um, and there was a bit of a bubble around the Flash game thing and you could... I mean, I think the yeah, you, you, you could make a game in a couple of weeks or a month and, and make like... Yeah tens of thousands of dollars which was insane at the time yeah. i was you know still a at university now. it's very different now um but that was kind of how mo- i started right and the really side note here from for the audience the monet- monetizing a game is every year it's different like the the way you make money could be different in 2025 versus yeah. 2023 and 2024 so it's always going to be different obviously you're always going to have steam sales and that's a huge driver of i'm, I'm sure your income and, and how Devolver is making money. But um, I just want my audience to know just because you and I made money when we were 18 doesn't mean it, it's it's completely different now, completely different. Um, but yeah. Definitely. And I, I, and I kind of, um, I, I think I feel very uh, privileged to have cut my teeth at a time where it was possible to do that. And, mm-hmm. and we kind of, you know, some of the games that we made didn't make loads of money and, and we, they kind of probably failed from a financial point of view but um it was very much like spending a couple of weeks or you know a month on a game and getting some money from it or maybe not so much but but kind of learning from that and then moving on to the next one and it was a really good um good way of kind of figuring out what works and but because with the flash games are all about um getting huge numbers uh, and also trying to hook players in as, as quickly as possible uh because yeah. there's so many of these games on these free websites that um you really have to grab people's attention uh, i think we kind of quickly learn what players responded well to and what they didn't so that so i, I feel yeah very lucky to have kind of started out there and, and kind of learn so much um because now if you're trying to starting out and you're like okay well i'm gonna make my first unity game and i'm gonna make it on uh release it on steam uh, and try and monetize that you, you kind of t- to make something that's financially viable is probably going to take you at least six months or a year or two years or however long um and there's not really so much of a a place to do that um now yeah. while also making money um right so yeah and that, so it was was making flash games and and had some some good success of that you know i, I worked on a lot of different flash games and started working quite closely with uh, Armour Games and doing a lot of art for their games. So we, we did Sushi Cat, which did really well. And I, I worked on some of the Blue Elephant games that um, JM TBO2 made, uh, Elephant Quest and Achievement yeah. Unlocked and uh, those games. Um, well, and... I think it would be valuable really quick to just, sorry to interrupt you, Jim, or Gimp, yeah, no, or, uh, Gimp or James, James, we're going to call you James. Okay, um... let's give it James. <laughs> Let's not go with Gimp. James. It's Jim. Not Gimp. <laughs> Chip. Uh, whatever. James. Let's. Sorry to interrupt you, James. But I want to make sure we we had clarity here. When you say you worked with Armor Games, what do you mean? Is that a publisher, or is that the the old Flash website and somehow they were paying you to make a game? Can you? Yes. Sorry. Add clarity um, there? So we. The, the the way that uh, traditionally with flash games you would make money would be you'd make a game and then you'd find a, a publisher a sponsor to sponsor it and they would put their um put their branding on the the game that you made and then this game would sort of spread around these thousands of different flash game websites and people would click the links uh it, on a game that they like and that would draw traffic back to the the sponsors um the sponsors website so, so that was the kind of traditional way but then we did some games that did well and Armour Games got in contact with me and they said, look, we, we're developing some games in-house. Would you like to uh, create some artwork for them? Um, so that was kind of a more of a commission-based thing where it was like, yeah. uh, you know, they pay me by the day um, and it was more sort of developing games in-house with them remotely. But um, uh, uh, So I was kind of doing that, but then I was also making my own games that I would then get sponsorship with 
a lot with other programmers as well. Um, but yeah, it was all kind of ad driven rather than uh, people paying to play the games. It was all like based on getting huge amounts of numbers. Uh, and, you know, you get one cents per click kind of thing or something like that. Yeah, exactly. Gotcha. Um, yeah, and and so had some real good success there, and then uh, I think it just got harder and harder to make money with flash games, and so uh, the and the iPhone came out, and I think people start playing Angry Birds um, on their phones and iPads rather than playing mini clip games on their desktop, um, and yeah, the the bottom kind of fell out of it, and we kind of were struggling more and more to to make a living doing it. So um, and that was about. Mm nine or ten years ago now and uh decided to start a, a studio with uh with jay armstrong who you i know you know and have spoken to very yes. recently uh and we we started massive monster um i think about nine and a half years ago now and we decided that we were going to make make real games you know uh with uh for console <laughs> yeah. i think we, we were kind of given a crossroads and it was like either move to mobile uh or or console steam games and, and we chose yeah. the the Steam, well, Steam isn't mo isn't mobile? Couldn't you say? Maybe I'm wrong here, but mobile would be more comparable to the Flash industry, right? Whereas, like, the game is free, and you got to figure out a way to make money somehow off of a ton of clicks. I think uh, so, yeah. Um, but we yeah. could kind of see where the monetization was going, and I think with with Flash, it was all about just making something really fun that's going to grab people's attention. Whereas um, with mobile, it was more about um microtransactions and how can we make this really fun game less fun so people will spend money on it um and that <laughs> always kind of rubbed me the wrong way a little bit yeah um, me too just wanted to create a thing and put it out there and and not have um the monetization affect it yep. uh, creatively or you know mechanically um so yeah that was the decision we made and, and i'm glad we did because um you know, I, I've got no beef, real beef with mobile games, and there's some great ones out there. But I, I do like making things that um, are, are sort of can be seen as a kind of a, a, a piece of art and a, something you, you kind of pour your heart, <clears throat> excuse me, something you yeah. pour your heart into, and you have that that product, uh, not product, that thing that you know uh, people can attach themselves to, rather than um, the kind of microtransactions, monetization, and all that fun world. Um, yeah. Yeah, and here we and here we are, and we, we made a made a few games. Um, we made we we did Adventure Pals, which I wasn't so directly involved with, um, but that that did pretty well. And then we did another one called Never Give Up, which didn't do so well. Um, and then Cut of the Lambs was our third game. Okay, well, I, let's let's sort of bridge the gap between this final point or the the point right before you guys started working on Cult of the Lamb, which is. I, I know the feeling, which is you, you spend four years working on a game and it just it's it just sort of flops on launch. Granted, mm. you know, Pinstripe, my game Pinstripe, and also Never Give Up and Adventure Pals, we all shared the same publisher, which was Armor Games. Yes. And yes, we made money. I, I know for me personally, Pinstripe made Armor Games money. It, it, it ended up making money, um, which was awesome. But it wasn't it wasn't that million dollar game that I had dreamt of, right? And that was kind of a sad moment for me. And so were you in a similar situation? Obviously, we don't have to talk about numbers, but in a similar situation where you're like, well, crap, I, I, I put my heart and soul into this thing and it's not, people don't seem to like it like I like it. Yeah, I, I think so to a degree. I mean, I think it was a slightly di different situation with, um, with Never Give Up because that was more of a work for hire I see. thing we, we did with for armor, armor games <clears throat> um who so it was based on an existing ip that they already had uh give up yeah. which was a very popular um flash game that you know did some crazy numbers and pewdiepie did a video and markiplier and all these big youtubers and it kind of went quite viral and i think they were like right we want to bring this to steam and kind of make like make like um a, a premium version um so it was yeah. kind of it was and i think at the time as well when we took that job it was like we'd just been struggling for money for so long all the time um yeah. and it was kind of like it sounded like a fun project and you know we thought it'd be good but it was wasn't necessarily kind of our baby our kind of big project that we mm -hmm. had always, always dreamt of doing um 
Yeah. But it was, and it was also a really hard project throughout development and had lots of issues and um, mm. sort of trying to do commission work and contract work as well at the same time to just pay the bills and stuff. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, so, and then it came out and I, I still don't think it's actually recouped, so it hasn't made any money. Yeah, um, yeah. So it's pretty tough and it, yeah, definitely pretty crushing. I, th I think especially coming from that flash game thing where it's like every month you're working on something new and if that if that thing flops then okay well on to the next one it doesn't matter it's only a couple of weeks couple yeah. of months of your life uh whereas this was like years um it's pretty crushing i definitely had yeah. like pretty bad burnout after that well the same is true with jay mentioned this that you know adventure pals didn't perform like they that you guys had hoped and there's this, there's this sort of precipice that you guys landed on. Please correct me if I'm wrong, where it's like you, you, you felt like we need to figure out how to make something that actually goes gangbusters because yeah. those two games that you worked on, they didn't necessarily prove that you guys were geniuses, right? <laughs> um, we knew we and, were, we just needed to prove it. Right, exactly. <laughs> I mean, and, I, and I'm saying that from, from my own personal emotional sort of uh, paradigm, which is like, I feel like I'm smart and I, I just, I just wish that, and I feel like I'm creative. And so there were times when I was making games where I would just be like, I just, I, I believe in this game. I just hope that the, the audience can confirm what I believe, you know? And there were moments where that just didn't happen where it's like, no, you know, it wasn't a great idea. Um, so you're yeah. at this, you're at this moment where you realize you need to make something gangbusters. And that is where we usher, we usher into the conversation about Cult of the Lamb. Specifically, I want to talk about Jay, Jay mentioned in, a, in, a, in the podcast that I did a couple weeks ago, he mentioned that with Cult of the Lamb, you guys had a similar approach where you're like, let's just make something silly and kind of wacky um, where you're like this, you're like a God riding on the back of a whale. Right. That's right. And yeah. something like that. Right. And then was it you who said, no, we need to come up with something striking and something that has a very strong hook? I think it was Julian who was. OK. Uh, well, I think it was all of us. I think. Yeah, because very much we were definitely at that point where it was like make or break, um, particularly after, you know, crunching on Never Give Up and it completely flopping. And as you say, kind of knowing that we thought we could do something that was really great and, and that people would, res would, would resonate with people. Mm -hmm. But we were also like getting into debt, uh, just trying to pay the pay rent and the bills. And mm. it was yeah. definitely a point where we're like, we really need to like, we need to do do this or not do it. And if this next one flops, then we are, we're done. Cause it, we, you can't do this forever, right? It's, you'd be better off just going, going to get a job somewhere. Um, so yeah, we so were definitely at that point. Um, awesome. Okay. So what are, what are some things that you slowly learned after, you know, I guess it was a decade of making games. What are some things that you learned from the art side that make a game eye catching that make people stop and stare at the game? What are some things that you feel, um, game developers need to, to apply and that mm. you apply to cult of the lamb? I think yeah with so with the the kind of the the floating the god on a floating whale idea and we had like lots of different ideas um and we actually kind of got got far enough with that idea that we were pitching it to publishers at, um at GDC and we kind of they weren't quite as interested um as we had hoped and we kind of went yeah. back to the drawing board and we were like well why is that and we kind of realized that the the idea was quite convoluted and we there was a lot of different ideas going on and we really needed to find that kind of that gem and that kind of concept um an idea and tagline that that people would resonate with and, and from like um and that kind of goes through from the, the idea of what the actual game is all the way through to the art style as well and they kind of all have to be um connected so i, I think for us it was from like a an art point of view it was once we had that idea like how do we attach um a style and um imagery that kind of helps elevate that and and everything kind of needs to all be working together towards the same goal um so like 
the idea of, of, of start your own cult, um, once we had that idea and that theme, uh, there was so much like visual identity that we could take from that. Um, you know, all the, the religious imagery um, and, and like making sure that that uh, goes through every single thing in the game um, from the, you know, the, the character designs to the colors you're using to the imagery throughout the world. Um, it all kind of works together to, to support that um, idea of starting your own cult. Um, gotcha. Yeah, and that was, yeah, I, th I think that was really a light bulb moment. And we were kind of, str I don't know if you've ever been in this position where you're kind of, you've got all these little nuggets of ideas and you're trying to piece them together and yeah. you kind of got these characters in mind, but you, they don't quite work for you. And you've got, you know what the game is, but it's like, oh, I don't know. And then you, for us anyway, you kind of, we, we had the, the idea of starting your own cult and then everything yeah. else kind of came real naturally after that. Um, yeah. I the know characters. the feeling. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I get I get it because um we're in that same exact situation with our game Twisted Tower and we stylistically we were kind of all over the place. We knew we liked BioShock, right? Um but that wasn't that wasn't enough. And so for for 2 years, well it was probably about a year, a year and a half, we were it felt like we were sort of floundering and trying mm -hmm. just trying to keep our head above water and not get drowned in too many ideas, too many visual flavors and visual styles. And it wasn't until we realized that it's a first person shooter fairy tale. That's nice. when we go, got it. That's there the style. Yeah. Um, and it all clicked. And that was actually very helpful with uh, a conversation I had with Jay. Um, it was about a year ago where I was like, that's, that's what we're going for. And so mm -hmm. essentially all we had to do was we said, okay, let's take Cinderella, let's take Alice in Wonderland, and let's put that into a first-person shooter. What does that look like, right? Yeah. Um, it, it was, and so you're so, you are so spot on when you say that the hook dictated the visual style. Um, yes. And my question about that is, can the visual style dictate the hook? Or should it, is it easier to start with the hook first and then spread that to the visual style. Hmm. I mean, I don't think there's a right or wrong way of doing it. I mean, I think if you look at something like Cuphead, that the art style is so first and foremost, like that is, like, I don't even really know what, it's a side-scrolling shooter, right? It's a really hard <laughs> side-scrolling shooter. Yeah. But um, yeah. it, the art style almost defines that entire game. Um, yeah. Uh, but I guess I, so you I, could, even even with that game, you could probably use the same mentality, which the hook is, it's if a 1930s, if a video game was in the 1930s. Right. And so so that's the hook, and then the visual style spreads after the hook. Yeah. Potentially, maybe. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I, th I think you can. You probably could approach it for both, from, from both directions. For, for us, yeah. it was very much like... We know we want to make Stardew Valley meets Binding of Isaac, but we need an idea to to unify those. And and as soon as it was like, okay, you're this you're this cult leader who's going out killing monsters, recruiting cute animals to this cult, uh, and we have the cult theme. Um, everything else kind of kind of came from that. Um, yeah. And that and and we also had like all as you say have all these different pieces. And you don't know how they all fit together. And then once you have that idea that defines the art style and it defines the game, but there's also all these other pieces that don't fit into that vi that vision that you just have to get rid of because uh, you, yeah. they're kind of muddying that vision and, and making it, um, you know, it, like the floating whale thing. It just didn't make sense. Like we had this idea for the, the for this floating whale, and it's, but it didn't really it was like a co cool idea that we liked but it just didn't fit yep. into that idea at all really and we could have probably trying to hammer it in but sometimes it's better just to sort of let, let go of these things that, that you become attached to because you put time into it but um you need to mm -hmm. it's definitely a big big lesson we learned on this one uh, the, well, the other thing i was going to say as well was um you know as as well as the finding the the hook and what the theme of your game is i think also just playing to your strengths and finding what your voice is as well because i think if you're if you're trying to sort of do something that 
doesn't come naturally and, and doesn't um isn't you as as an artist then it's Sorry, been I... really hard the whole way through um to make it work so i, th I think uh our games have always been kind of cute, cartoony, 2D, um, kind of hand-drawn style. Um, so we kind of, it was really important to us to kind of keep that um, as a huge part of the, the game. Uh, but then we knew we wanted to add these darker elements as well um, and the religious imagery, and that kind of helped. Well, it that all contrast come together, is a huge. I th yeah, I think if we had tried right. to make it like really grit gritty and, and some kind of style that wasn't us and didn't come naturally, then it would have been a lot harder to, to stand out and for it to feel true to us. Gotcha. Um, sorry, we're getting some lag here. Hang on one sec. Can you oh, say sorry. something? No, no, it's not your fault. Um, you there? Hello. Yes, Hello. I can hear you. Okay. okay, good. Yeah, no big deal. We don't need to, you know, start over or cut anything. We'll, we'll just keep rolling. Okay. That, that, con that contrast is, was it luck? The reason I say that is because your strength um, your, yours and Julian's strength is cute, uh, hyper cute characters. Um, and that was like, I, I think all the way back to the Happy Tree Friends. Do you remember Happy Tree Friends? Yeah, of course. Um, of course. And I'm sure that was an inspiration for you guys because Happy. Well, the reason why Happy Tree Friends, and for those, those of you listening who don't know, it's just basically a bunch of forest creatures, super cute, kind of like warner brothers vibes or even even like a kit like a nick jr show but all of them are getting like slaughtered right <laughs> that was from like early 2000s um i remember watching those videos and feeling really cool when i was in middle school but the reason yeah. why those did so well is because there was contrast right you have super cute and then super dark and you slam them together and you get something that's viral when it comes to cult of the lamb was that an intentional thought process of we're going to create contrast how do we create contrast okay let's put cults next to cute creatures or what were you were you kind of lucky where it just worked out and that contrast became viral it was it was definitely a conscious decision to i mean i think it came in two parts the, the first part was um we had a lot of our previous games um and like adventure powers for example which is like really quite cute and kind of silly um and i think we saw a lot of comments of people thinking it was like a kid's game um yeah and kind of and i think as soon as you have that cartoon style uh particularly the uh, our specific style which is quite like saturday morning cartoon um I, I think it instantly puts quite a lot of people off and then we were sort of seeing games like don't starve and binding of isaac um which had a real element of darkness to them and, and had huge success. Um, mm -hmm. so I think it was, it was, so it was definitely a conscious decision to, that we wanted to keep, keep the, the kind of cute cartoony stuff, but we also really wanted to, um, to add the darkness and, and make it a bit messed up. Um, I, I think coming from flash games, the for me at least i think the the super cute cartoon stuff went really well and was really popular and and that i kind of fell into a little bit of a trap doing that um like starting out at, like you said I, I um i loved happy tree friends and we and i even made like my own sort of knockoff happy tree friends <laughs> cartoons and that kind of thing yep. but i, yep. I kind of lost that kind of that darkness a little bit um yep i think just because i i saw such success with the, the cutesy stuff but then going to sort of Steam games, I, I think the audience is quite different there, um, mm -hmm. the, and they really appreciate that. So I, it was it was definitely like quite early on um, something that we wanted to do, and the, before we had the the cult idea, and then I think when we had that the idea start your own cult, it just it all fell into place because we're like right, well you're this kind of you know satanic uh, cult leader, but then the animals are really cute, and that kind of juxtaposition. Um, felt really natural and it came very naturally and, and it was a theme that we wanted to explore as well was the sort of the good and evil the light and dark the, the cute and the horrific um and yep. and as a cult leader like you're, you're sort of you're given this power um are, do you do good or do you do bad um so that kind right. of it was it it was almost a happy accident um in the the, the kind of theme eventually came together so well with with the mm. art direction um so yeah, it was a kind of mix of both, I guess, I guess. Well, you know, I see the game and I, 
when I when I look at everything that from the gameplay to the story to the hook to the themes and and even to the visuals everything it leans on one primary principle and this is just my theory it's all about contrast it's like there's contrast in everything mm-hmm. and yeah. can we talk about that when it comes to color and lighting um and 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 even like marketing material like when when i look at cult of the lamb your color palette is so bizarre <laughs> but it it's it, i can t- i can almost taste it it's so flavorful I like, can you how talk does it to taste me? it tastes kind of like a, a a really sugary cupcake with like jalapenos in it like, oh it's, nice <laughs> it's sounds like awful so, i know right it's so, but you wouldn't think it works but there's actually desserts that do that where they, it's yeah. like you've got contrast of two two seemingly different flavors that wouldn't work together but they work you've got you've got vibrant almost it's almost like a neon red mixed mm-hmm. with like a parchment yellow um and so i'm curious if you could speak to just some tips and tricks and your thought process behind color theory when it comes to cult of the lamb yeah totally i mean i think very early on the project uh, originally we wanted to make the whole game in this um very limited color palette uh and i think we were like you know let's you got to pick five colors and everything in the game has got to use just those colors and there's no other colors allowed and 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 i think um some games do that really well and keep things really striking for us that idea kind of fell away a little bit because i think we wanted all these different color animals and we wanted the the biomes to feel quite different color wise um but that that idea um still kind of persisted through a lot of the marketing images and and um the characters um so i think yeah picking a a palette to, that kind of defines your game early on can, can be really powerful um even if you don't like exclusively use it for the artwork um i think it can really help um form the identity of the game so i think with caught in the lamb you got the the black and the red um which are kind of quite evil and dark but then it's really had the uh, the kind of light white white cream color to kind of represent the lightness um and also there's like a kind of bright uh green, neony greeny blue that we use as well um which is quite a light sort of holy holy color um which we don't use as often but um yeah and i think that really helped particularly with like the ui and the mm-hmm. the kind of the marketing stuff to just keep things consistent and kind of uh keep like an, a visual identity for the game that kind of goes through everything um yeah. so yeah i think that's super valuable to do um so how kind of, did you go ahead i'm sorry i was going to say um so it's kind of quite early on in the project we kind of in the pre we went through a lot of pre-production and we we, we kind of came up with this color scheme and the the fonts and some symbols and um basically a set of rules and visual motifs that um that we wanted to use and kind of created a bit of a bible um and that was really useful just as we kind of went through the the full production of the game to, to have that to refer back to um and make sure everything kind of uses some of these ideas and i think mm-hmm. especially when you're kind of bringing on other artists as well like later in the process it's really useful to have those those rules you set out for the the world and the the imagery and the the identity of the game um to have that to refer back to um and make sure that you're kind of yeah just it's that's permeating through every every aspect of it yep color is a it's almost like a sixth sense um obviously we can all see you know but what i mean is like to be able to know which colors work together just right away like you can immediately go red black cream like you just know um a lot of people listening i would argue the majority of listeners they don't have that sense and that's not it's not anybody's fault it's just certain people are just gifted in that way could you recommend any way for my audience to know where to what to lean on if they don't necessarily have that gifting? Yeah. Like, are there um, any tools or or websites <clears throat> that they can lean on to to choose a color palette? Yeah, and there's loads of websites out there. Um, even like you, you go on uh, Illustrator and there's kind of um, you can choose different color palettes and it will it will 
show you what the complementary colours are. So if, if you pick, like, let's mm. say, a, a red that you really like and you're like, okay, I want to base this, I want to use this colour as, like, the, the kind of core, um, yeah. it will then, it will show you, and they have different names of, like, the different colour theory um, palettes, and it will show you all the different complementary colours and the secondary colours, and that can be really useful, um, even if you, like, you know, you don't know, and I don't really know too much colour theory, and I kind of base a lot of stuff on just trial and error, yep. to be, if I'm perfectly honest, uh, yeah. And that, but you kind of find that the stuff that you end up stumbling on through trial and error uh, is actually following the, the rules of colour theory. Um, yeah. So just just like, you know, picking a colour that you think looks really nice, using a tool to find the complement, co complementary colours um, is a really good way of kind of getting you there. Um, and I'm sure there's loads of YouTube um, tutorials about uh, and or videos about like the meaning behind different colours, like, you know, mm -hmm. red is a kind of warning danger colour whereas blue is kind of serene yeah. and relaxing and all these uh, different kind of uh, themes and emotions that you can attach to different colours um, should be relatively easy to find um, and I think a lot of it is kind of almost obvious when you read it but um, yeah I think it's... well you know there's there's uh, something I've identified I, I've studied y'all's artwork um obsessively because i love i love 2d art and i i'm so impressed with what you've done and something i've noticed is there's there's three types of contrast you use you use contrast in hue contrast in lightness and contrast in saturation um the point being you know with hue it's complementary colors so you have you have red and then you have a the blue right yeah um those are your complementary colors generally speaking and it might be a full, like 180 degree contrast, but it might actually be even triadic. I'm not sure. But you also have contrast and saturation, which is you've got that low saturation, um, uh, almost like a, a paper color, the, the, the mm -hmm. cream, right? And then you've got a super high saturation, like 100% high saturation of that red, right? Yeah. And then you've also got contrast and lightness where you've got dark dark shadows and silhouettes and then you've got vibrant bright probably near the center of where you manage your cult so you've got this sort of contrast in in every way when it comes to color uh, and you guys have really really mastered that because when i look at your previous games you didn't necessarily do that um i want to lead that into a question i sort of a final question about color which is how mm -hmm. did you guys ever stretch your legs outside of those rules was there ever a moment where you go, you know what, we need to do a little bit of pink here, or we need to do a little bit of yellow here? Yeah, definitely. I, and I think that's kind of why, yeah, originally, as I say, we were trying to use this very limited palette, but it kind of felt a little bit too limiting in the mm -hmm. in, to, to use for everything. Um, because we, yeah, we, we wanted the game to feel really vibrant as well. Mm -hmm. And I think all our games have always have been, and we want it to feel yeah super colorful and like a saturday morning cartoon so i think there's definitely areas that you can can stray stray from it but some sometimes it does just look out of place so i think it's for me it's just been a bit of trial and error um yeah uh, and making certain things pop that you want to kind of draw attention to um i think with all the all the kind of core things and the main visual language in the game we we do try and stick to it uh to those kind of core um core colors that we use for the identity but yeah i i do find myself just putting in other stuff here and there just to kind of make it feel unique in the world kind of thing like yep. for like for example we we've got all these buildings in the cult right and and um a lot of it is kind of it's all like sort of natural materials and a lot of it is uh wood and stone and you know wood painted red and using that kind of uh the, that palette that we've used for a lot of stuff um, and, gr and green as well for like the grass because we wanted it to feel verdant and, and um, you know luscious um, yeah. but I have found with like more the more recent buildings I kind of want to mix up a little bit so we've added like a tailor building and I just didn't feel right in all these different colors and I tried all the different colors and then I kind of just tried it like a, a pink and purple and it just <laughs> just worked and it, it, it gave the it's quite a flamboyant kind of color scheme um which kind of fits with the idea of uh tailoring clothes and dressing up your followers and it just right. made it it kind of gave that 
building its own identity and there wasn't really much of a like mindset or reasoning behind it other than that I was just trying all these different colors and that worked it looked it looked good and it just it just felt right so um yeah I think a lot of it is just kind of what feels right and what um experimenting I think and don't be too afraid to break your own rules as well because um yeah. you know that's that's sometimes where the magic comes from if it's not working and you're following all these rules that you set and then sometimes when the uh when you break your own rules that's when the kind of real magic happens okay so to sort of wrap up the color conversation would you agree that it's it's a it's a generally it's a good idea to have a set color palette that is your brand it's kind of what you put in your your bible your your yeah. the Bi for those who listening who don't know a bible would be what are the fonts what are the colors what's the what's the themes what are the the symbols and identities um so yes it's good to have a set standard for color and to build your game on that foundation and then once you're sort of once you fully understand that language, that color language, then you can start sprinkling in new colors. But it's it's best to start with a foundation first. Would you agree that that's a general, a good general rule? Absolutely, yeah, yeah, and that really okay. helps kind of uh, just give it that identity and and feel consistent. Um, okay. Yeah. Tight. Cool. Okay. Well, now that we understand how you created this. Uh, or, or the, sort of the thought process or the philosophy behind the art direction. Let's talk about the technical side. Okay. Um, before we get into the, the point A to point Z of how you actually did it all, um, let's talk about tools really quick. So let's just really quick list off the tools you use for the artwork. Yeah, uh, super simple really. We just draw everything in Photoshop, import it into Unity, Job done. For the animation, I use Spine, which is really good. Uh, a great little 2D animation tool. Um, but yeah, beyond that, there's not really much else. It's all... What about an Illustrator? Haven't used Illustrator for anything, Nate. <laughs> me neither. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I don't like using it. It's so clunky for me. Um, it's heavy. Uh, it yeah, it's, it's kind of like overkill. I mean, I, I always come from that, that flash flash game background which is vector based mm -hmm. um so this yeah. was actually the first game we ever did that used photoshops and it was a uh, quite the learning experience going mm -hmm. from doing everything in flash to, to photoshop but i think we wanted there's another thing that we kind of noticed looking at a lot of um other games was like having that kind of more textured feel um mm -hmm. that you, you you can only really get from bit from bitmap is is gives a kind of sense of uh, I don't know what it is it's a sort of sense of depth and grit and almost authenticity and it might just be like a what what's currently popular thing um yeah. but that was kind of definitely a conscious decision as well was to try and keep the cartoony uh cartoon bright colorful style but also add that layer in the the darkness and the and the grit and slightly rough edges uh to, to the lines and stuff um, okay. So yeah, it was it was definitely a big learning process moving from that. But then we were like, yeah, it's there's no vector. It's all it's all uh, all Photoshop. Um, okay. Well, what about what about sourcing texture work? Um, sourcing brushes. Um, yes, we've got Photoshop and we've got Unity, and they work. Those two are probably open ninety five percent of the time. But do you ever find yourself in a browser, going and, yeah. and grabbing some textures or assets? Yeah, so yeah, we definitely we, we found some brushes um, that we liked and that were kind of just you know available for free, and then we kind of mm -hmm. tweaked them a little bit. We've got like the we've got the line brush, and then we've got the the shading brush, and then there's like a watercolor brush which we use to kind of create a lot of the the shadows and textures and kind of grit, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. And so we don't really use too much actual like uh, like textures sprites or anything in the game it's all kind of usually just drawn by hand um but yeah definitely finding the right brushes because right. uh, it was a big part of just trying to get the get the style we wanted down and having those and again like putting those in the bible and deciding what the line widths are going to use for the characters are and what the line widths are going to use for the uh the environments are and what brush we're going to use for the shadows and making sure that we follow that throughout the whole game and so it's, everything's consistent there um but yeah it's, it's pretty ba pretty basic really we've got 
four, three or four, four, but four brushes in Photoshop, um, and then just draw it, draw it straight in Photoshop, import it mm. into Unity, and yeah, there's not much, too much else from a, like a technical point of view until yeah. uh, it's in, actually in the game, and right. then. Well, what about hardware? Are we using a mouse? Are we using a Wacom pen tablet? Yeah, I got Wacom, um, which is great. Um, and just uh, I started out on a MacBook, MacBook um, and the the Photoshop files just got bigger and bigger, and the MacBook kind of <laughs> struggled more and more. And uh, Julian persuaded me to to get a decent PC, and it was um, yep. It was amazing, to be honest. Like it's amazing having the <laughs> the, str the scratch discs not running out, and just uh, I know. you know, I think once well, you're you... working with big files, it really slows you down eventually. You could buy a Mac that that runs great, but it would be five grand. Exactly. Um, so <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, I I had to convert to PC as well, obviously, but I ended up actually. One sec, I'm going to show the camera. I ended up buying a a Mac Studio because. I, because it's the only, um, well, it's the only thing that'll run Logic Pro. Uh, so I write yeah. my write my music as well. So I have my setup here currently is I have a little switcher. It, it's stuck to the side of my PC, and it switches m between my it, my two monitors. It'll switch both monitors between Mac and PC. Um, oh, very fancy. So it's sort of yeah. It's it's. I'm trying my best to automate everything because. Um, and that's why I have my my keyboard on my desk right now, my my uh, MIDI controller, because uh, as quick as possible, um, I could switch between different crafts. Um, the 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 less frustrated I am when I'm making games. So that's that's what I'm kind of setting up my studio to do right now. But for that's you, you know, cool. you yeah, I appreciate it. For you, you're just spending all your time in Photoshop, right? Photoshop. You have a, <laughs> a pen tablet. And then, are you importing the PSDs, PSBs, or PNGs to Unity? Usually, it's PNGs. Yeah. Really? Um, so you're exporting everything. You're not. You're not. You're not saving the PSDs. Yeah, I don't know if that's the right way to do it. To be honest, <laughs> uh, with with Spine, um, we we do export the PSDs because um, you can kind of set the layers up. Uh, yeah. In for a character, and you have like the arms and different body parts, and then you can export yeah. the PSD and then import that into Spine into Spine, which mm -hmm. is is, is save some time. But um, yeah, usually I don't know. I don't know, man. We don't know what we're doing. We just. <laughs> yeah, well, clearly you did. Yeah, I, I ask because I abandoned exporting PNGs and I also abandoned Spine for oh, yeah. Unity's pr proprietary PSD importer. They also have a PSB importer, which allows you to weight paint your actual uh, character inside of Unity with Unity's new uh, 2D animation tool. So I was curious because because I I left Spine, but I'm I know that it's still having updates and i was curious um about that so let's let's move this discussion into the technical side i would love to okay. hear and we could talk about spine and, and all that um i'm going to frame this question so that you can you can hopefully give us like the most effective answer um because i could say how did you do it like how how, do you, how are you creating art but what i'm going to frame the question is is a little bit more precise which is if you were to tell your your let's say your 18 year old self here's how you're going to do artwork from start to finish for this multi-million dollar explosive viral game what is that process like from start to finish that means from ideation to pen and paper to photoshop to unity what's the process look like from like a, from a creative point of view or um... yeah the, the creative side but primarily the technical side the creative side would be like more like the ideas and, uh, but mainly I'm looking for like the technical side. Like if you were to teach this, and and people wanted to learn how you did what you did with the artwork, what's it look like? Um, that's tricky. I think just 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 practice lots, right? Uh, and and learn how to use the tools as well. And I'm I'm still I'm very stuck in my ways about not learning new techniques and stuff. So I think it's just <laughs> like I really I really am, and it. Um, it, and it's bad, but I, I think you know it's really important to be 
to not be afraid of learning new techniques and because mm-hmm. even like going from flash to photoshop i was really stubborn about it and i didn't like it and it took me a long while to get used to it but yeah, i think ultimately it was it was for the best so i think it's just really important yeah and this is a you know this is advice for myself right now as well is, is don't be afraid of you know learning and, and pushing yourself to try new things and techniques because uh, in the long run you're probably going to save yourself a lot of time um but yeah I, I don't know i think just just um just stick at well, it and, and keep practicing and learning and does it start let's let's figure out like the 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 line okay so starting from point a to point b it, it's a difficult question I, I understand i i i totally get it that's why i'm trying to i'm trying to learn how to frame this when i ask mm. developers who come on the podcast because it's a difficult question which is cuz a lot of times we're just on autopilot and it's yep. like what you just draw a character and learn how to draw a character so maybe I'll ask it a different way. Does it start on a piece of paper? Does, for example, a character. Does it start as a sketch? Usually, I I'm not the I don't do too much drawing on paper. Um, I, I I find it kind of quicker. Um, and I'm just so used to drawing on a on a computer. And yeah, but, but yeah, I think it's kind of with yeah. How do you start out with drawing a character, designing it? I think it's figuring out what what the character's personality is and what are the goals that you want the character to be so, so for, for for cult of the lamb um we wanted the lamb to to feel really iconic and simple uh but also you know complicated enough that it was it felt interesting um and we and that, that kind of involved lots of tweaking and copy and pasting the same design but changing the size of the eyes slightly or changing the the style of the ears or and just kind of really going through iteration and kind of doing it in a I mean I'd love to say you just kind of sit and sketch it a few times and then you're like okay that's the that's the perfect character but it's really been a kind of uh, a case of iterating and just tiny changes until you kind of figure out the what works best through um just changing things and, and kind of yeah going through many many different versions um and maybe that's not the kind of right the most cr- kind oh, of creative yeah. auteur way like you love to think that um true artists just create things out of thin air but that for us that's definitely <laughs> been the the process you know yeah. drawing lots of things picking bits that you kind of like from one and others and kind of putting them together and then redrawing it and redrawing it and eventually you kind of get to something you're like okay this is this is the one um yep and so that's all done in photoshop you just open up photoshop is it a 4k document for let's say a character for example so would you just start with a 4k document or would you start really rough with super duper rough yeah just like super lines and kind of because i think you kind of want the you know, it's important that the silhouette's strong um, and the, the, the main features are, like the defining features are kind of figured out first. And then once you have, and you can do that just with very simple, thick, basic lines. Yeah. It doesn't have to be like, look too good. It's just like uh, fig- figuring out what the, yeah, the silhouette and the defining features of that character are. And then once you have that, you can go in and um, do more details and kind of tweak mm-hmm. the different features and try out different ideas for them um, until you kind of, iterating it and then once you're like okay this is the design and it's still kind of rough but i've kind of copy and pasted the horns from this one onto this one and then i'm like okay this looks good and then you kind of actually draw it for real kind of thing once you the design is is decided it's um you actually do the the final one and that's when you try and like really caring about making every line perfect and until that point you don't need to worry too much about that um it's just kind of like a logo it's kind of like logo design yeah totally Uh, yeah Okay. Uh, tell me more the... about this. Tell me more about the silhouette. What do you mean by silhouette is strong? What does that mean? Um, so I think there's this principle that you that a good character has like a really you can tell which what the character is just by looking at his silhouette. So if you kind of take um, Homer Simpson or Marge Simpson and just fill it in full black, and all you can see is the the shadow of it, the silhouette, uh, you can still recognize what the character is, and it has a very clean, well defined silhouette Mm -hmm. um and that just really helps with just making a character recognizable and um iconic um because sometimes you have you know i'm drawing a character and i'm like okay i want it to have huge horns and i want it to have these kind of i don't know big eyebrows and ears or whatever but if they're kind of overlapping and it kind of makes a bit of a mess it doesn't make doesn't 
just doesn't work and it doesn't it looks yeah. a bit messy and you're like okay well i wanted it to have these big horns but if i shrink the horns a little bit and it kind of stops it overlapping from the ears or whatever then that kind of it, it, the overall uh design is is a lot stronger and more easy right. for for the viewer to kind of um just decipher at a glance and just i don't know it's a kind of it's a funny yeah. thing that you just kind of intrinsically notice i think or subconsciously exactly. notice yeah i've been i've been learning that actually it's so funny i've been doing this for 10 years I mean, honestly it's been about 15 years of making games we're making 3d games now but you know i was making 2d games mm. you know right alongside you we were just in different places in the world uh, and we didn't know each other but we were making 2d games at the same sort of age and time and i never th i never knew about the silhouette principle i just i guess instinctively kind of understood it yeah um you know i think and, it's one, yeah there are so many different theory things that you you don't necessarily know the theory behind but you kind of mm -hmm. you read about the theory and you're like okay well i, I do that already and i it took me <laughs> six years to figure it out i wish i'd read a book <laughs> um, i know yeah. i know i know <laughs> well okay so so do you illustrate your characters or do you let's say do you conceptualize your characters in the context of the game so what I mean is, do you screenshot something from the game? Do you understand what your world looks like before you make your character? Because I know when it comes to the silhouette, you can't even see the silhouette if the character's blending into the color palette of the background. Um, so yeah. what's your process look like there? Yeah, I think you definitely want to know the context of what it's going to be in. Um, particularly, I mean, I guess for, for Cult of the Lamb, if I'm designing and and it, because we kind of wanted the the designs of the characters to be quite um like the enemies and stuff we wanted each biome to have its own uh kind of type of animal and and color palette and that we want the certain enemies if if an enemy's if it's an enemy that kind of shoots a exploding bomb and there's like a there's a frog that does that or there's uh you know there's a jellyfish that does a similar thing we want those mm -hmm. all those kind of types of enemies to be a specific color but then we yeah. also want them to fit in their uh respective biomes um and then there's also like these uh kind of orange globules that we have on certain enemies and if they ha if an enemy has that then it explodes uh well you know it's going to explode when you kill it kind of thing and all these kind of different rules um that you kind of uh used to the player kind of understands i mean maybe that's something that's a little bit more specific to enemy designs or you know the the more the mm -hmm. gameplay stuff um yeah so you kind of d develop this visual language and it's kind of tricky because sometimes it can be hard to be creative because you're like, okay, well, it's got to be a, a frog because it's in this area and it's got to be this color because it's, you know, this type of enemy and it's got to have this because it's going to do this when it dies. And um, right. but you got to kind of design the character within those uh, limitations, I guess. Hmm. Okay. Um, okay, so you've got your character, you, you use context. So you're creating your character maybe with a backdrop or a background in Photoshop to, to understand where it is when it comes to the color so it stands out yes. now do you are your characters um are they designed with layers um or do you do you merge all the layers together and it's just a drawing and then you create sprite animations from it or do you so, rig up the character with various layers what's your process like for animation and setting it up for rigging yeah it's all in different layers um so and i i really like um with Cult of the Lamb, we wanted we wanted a vibe, right? And we wanted a, a very bouncy kind of everything's moving all the time. So I, I think I like having different bits that I know are going to move or are going to kind of wave um, and stuff. So you kind of you, you, everything's on a separate layer, and then uh, if an arm uh, you know it's going to bend, you have to kind of draw it straight um, because you're going to rig that up to a mesh. So you, certain things you'll have to draw, like, or a jellyfish, for example, all the, the jellyfish tendrils will have to be, you draw them straight. So then you can kind yeah. of, uh, turn them into a mesh and bind the mesh to a bone and make them animated. So yeah, e draw everything straight and in a, a way that is not deformed and it, it can be deformed from, um, hmm. export them into spine. And then you, you kind of set them up in 
the the layout that they're going to have attach bones to them if it's going to be a mesh which means yeah you just um kind of you want to deform them like you would uh, a jellyfish limb or um I mean, pretty much everything in Cult of the Lamb is meshes because we really wanted everything to have a sort of squash and a stretch and a sway and a, uh, we wanted it to feel bouncy. Um, and yeah, and then just attach the bones to it and and you're good to go. Gotcha, gotcha. So let's talk about iteration really quick. Mm-hmm. How often, I, I'm going to assume, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm going to assume that you weren't just one and done. It's like, yay, we, we made the protagonist and we're good to go. Did you did you have to go back to the drawing board and do it all over again multiple times? Oh my god, so many times with everything. Like we, we um, particularly early on in the game when we're you know, even when we decided the the cult theme and stuff, we really were absolutely brutal with everything, uh, particularly like the important stuff. But even the stuff that isn't even that important, just um, uh, really particularly like me, Jay, and Julian just just being brutal with each other about what we thought about it and whether it worked or if it sucked or if we think it could be better. Um, Mm -hmm. And then you finally get to a place where you're like, okay, this is good. And you get it in and it's good. And then you're like, okay, I'm happy with this. This is great. How can we elevate it and make it even better? Um, And that's sort of something we've really tried to do throughout the whole process with everything in the game was, was really um, when you're happy with it and you think it's good enough, how can you make it better? Um, Yeah. Uh, really pushing yourself to, to do that um it was did a brutal it, process it, though it, well you you mentioned it's brutal my what i'm curious about is did it ever make you think like we're incompetent and we're 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 <laughs> wait yes. we're we are a wasteful team um, always i ask that from personal experience because i feel that way all the time especially when i'm delegating to a team because i'm like i'm sorry you're gonna have to redo this but you need to redo it and then I yeah. already apologized for it. And then two weeks later, I say, sorry, bud, you're going to have to redo it again. And so I feel incompetent, you know? Yeah, totally. I always feel I always feel that, um, you know, imposter syndrome. And I think everyone mm-hmm. does. I, but to be honest, I think it's um, it's something that keeps you humble. Uh, I think as, as soon as you think everything you do is hot shit, then you're going to stop trying. So I think it's, <laughs> I think it's important to, to, to keep that. Uh, yeah. But yeah, it's, it can be very frustrating and it can be, I, th- I think particularly at the beginning of the project where I was at a place where we just don't never give up uh, and it flopped, didn't make any money. I was very frustrated. I was moving from Flash to Photoshop. It's kind of, it's about, and just um, I felt like nothing was good enough. But I think you, you just have to kind of stick with it and really uh, find your motivation and dig deep and... and um, yeah, just just keep banging your head about it. Sometimes move on to something different, um, and then come back to it with fresh eyes. Um, I have a very bad habit of kind of sitting and being like, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna get this character or animation or whatever it's done done this evening, and then it's sort of two a.m. and it's it's still not good enough. Um, <laughs> uh, no, I'm not going to bed until it's done. But I think sometimes walking yeah. away and coming back to it with fresh eyes can yeah. be really valuable. Um, I or feel just the same way. Throwing yeah. it away, starting from scratch. Yeah, man, it's such a terrible feeling. It's almost like a drug where you're, you're, you're glued to your computer. And you, if for me, so I've got three kids. Well, I've got a third one on the way, and nice. I get off at I'm I, I'm supposed to get off at five thirty, mm-hmm. and when it's five twenty nine, I'm like so obsessed with trying to figure something out, you know, and yeah. you got to just you almost got to rip the bandaid off and like slam your computer your laptop closed or turn your computer off and just get out uh and stop yourself because something about making games is super addicting i don't do you feel that way do you feel kind of like a workaholic oh yeah i'm a complete obsessed obsessive um you know really dialing down and obsessing over every tiny little detail like sometimes yeah. to the pixel you know it's ridiculous but um <laughs> uh, it's, it just doesn't quite look right and you're tweaking it tweaking it tweaking it tweaking it and eventually yeah. you get there um but yeah I, I think uh i think it's a dangerous thing but i also th- i i kind of i don't think i think it'd be very hard to do it without without having a little bit of that in you um, yeah well, John Carpenter, I don't know if you like any of his films, um, 
But you I know, don't know if I've watched too much of it, but yeah, I, I'm I'm well like aware. Of... Halloween and, and yeah. the thing, and he um, he mentioned that he never likes his movies. He's never happy with his <laughs> films. Um, when I see Cult of the Lamb, I think this is a perfect game. There, there oh, yeah. are n- wow. there's literally I do I really do I see a perfect game and I'm I'm sure most people do. Um, my question for you is sort of to wrap this up here. This is sort of a final question. Do you see a perfect game? No, definitely not. Uh, definitely not. Uh, I, I, yeah, I, I think you... I don't know if there's even ever, any, a such thing as a perfect game. Um, and I think you're always thinking about things that you can improve. Uh, you're always seeing the flaws in it. Um, but it's just about getting it to a, a place where you're as as close as possible to being happy. I mean, I was I was playing I was start playing uh, Hollow Knight again uh, over the weekend, and I was playing that game, and then I kind of jumped over to Cult of the Lamb just because the the new updates just came out, and I wanted to test it a little bit on PlayStation because I haven't played the new update on PlayStation. And I was like, going from Hollow Knight to Cult of the Lamb, I was like, oh, God damn it, the colors are all wrong. <laughs> it just looks like crap compared to Hollow Knight. Um, oh, man. And yeah, you know, you're you're always thinking of, oh, could have done this better. And it's too late now, but um, yeah. Yeah, so I I, I, I I struggle to even see that discrepancy. Like <laughs> when I see Call of the Lamb and I see Hollow Knight, to me they're they're both equally equally valid in their uh, their um, their visuals. Uh, I take that as a huge compliment. Phenomenal. Thank you. I'm not sure. I, agree, I mean, but... <laughs> Hollow Knight, Hollow Knight, Hollow Knight is a huge inspiration to me as well. Yeah, and it obviously, and there's there's something. There's something to be said about the painful growth or the, the, the painful process of learning to hate what you just loved. So like you, like you mentioned, staying up till 2 a.m. and you're, you're, you're making these characters perfect. Well, they're perfect until 2 a.m. And then a week later you look back and you go, well, actually I should have done this and I should have done that, <laughs> you know? And so, yeah. you know, you're, you've grown, right? And so that is like, I can't, I, I, what I'm trying to say here is 99.9% of the people listening to this podcast don't have that visual muscle that you now have where you can critique Cult of the Lamb, but I couldn't. And my audience couldn't. We couldn't see what you see, and that is a huge gift. But it also hurts at the same time. You know what I mean? That's why we're just still updating the game. Just gonna be. We'll do another <laughs> one in in ten years' time, and I'll still be like, yeah, it's not. It's not perfect yet. So. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. Well, speaking of updates, uh, to wrap up here, um, we in the description of this video is the. Obviously, linked to the Cult of the Lamb, um, but you guys recently did an update. Uh, do you want to talk about it? Yeah, we did. Um, we did an update called Sins of the Flesh, which uh, adds. It's kind of meant to be the the cult depth update. So the previous one we did was like more depth to the dungeon, and this mm-hmm. one's more depth to the cult. Um, mm-hmm. Ideally, we would have done both at the same time, but we just ended up adding so much stuff. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, it adds lots of new fun stuff like uh, follower mating, so you can have a little have two followers go in the little tent and you get an egg and then you can hatch the <laughs> egg into a baby follower, um, and you can do a nudism ritual, so you, you know your followers will throw their robes <laughs> off and dance around with a little leaf covering their private parts. Um, That's so funny. There's a drink house, so you can you can grow hops and grapes and brew brew uh, drinks for your followers to get. Uh, befuddled or yeah um get them all drunk <laughs> um i love that that's such a good idea that's so good man well <laughs> it's all so kind you guys of creating have, have sin. Like, that's it's, right exactly yeah so you're kind of in a situation where feature creep is is happening after launch yeah. uh, which is great because it keeps people engaged and you you guys have a i think you have an evergreen game and you should be really really proud um and so, yeah, dude, I'm so grateful for your time here. I feel really, really lucky to be able to talk to you because not everybody can. And um, I appreciate your time, dude. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Thomas. It's been lovely. Yeah. Um, big fan of your work as well. So it's um, yeah, Thanks. it's been great to catch up. Um, yeah. Yeah.
Thank you very cool. much. Yeah, man. All right, take it easy. Bye. Get over here. Get down. Hey, thanks for watching. By the way, if you haven't downloaded that free 2D game kit below, click below, it's my treat to you. I used this game kit to make a game for PewDiePie in 14 days, and I actually got to play it with him in front of his audience, which was really cool. This game kit is totally free. It's my treat to you, and you can use it however you want. You can make a commercial game and make a million bucks off this game kit. I don't care. Or you could just use it for a hobby project. It's my treat to you. And by the way, if you haven't clicked like, that would mean a ton to me, hit subscribe, and also, this is important, hit that notification bell, here's why. If you get notified of when I'm live, you can watch me make my next game and let me know in the chat what you think about the game or any ideas you have, and you might just show up, your chat might just show up in the next video that I upload. All right, I'll talk to you later, bye. I love you too.